morning, everyone. My name is Nicolas Ed. Uh, today, I will be sharing this session together with Jean-Mathieu Beauregard. So we, as a former fellows at Peter Mac, it's a great pleasure for us to introduce our dear friend and mentor, Rondé Hicks. Jean-Mathieu. So uh, most of you, uh, uh, particularly those who assisted yesterday to the pre-symposium, uh, know already a, a lot about Rod, but so I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, so Rod is a professor of medicine and radiology at the University of Melbourne and director of the cancer, uh, Center for Cancer Imaging at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center. He's the editor-in-chief of Cancer Imaging. He has published over um, 400 peer-reviewed papers uh, and uh, has been cited 13,000 13, times. Um, he has been uh, involved in the uh, theranistic, particularly of neuroendocrine tumor, over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, oh, that's it. Uh, Rod? Thank you very much. Uh, I actually hadn't planned to speak at this, uh, this meeting. I'd hoped to just go around and meet old friends and, and talk, but unfortunately Hans Jürgen Vest uh, also had to pull out of this meeting, so I've stepped into the breach uh, somewhat to talk about uh, Theranostics, uh, where we've been and where we're going. Uh, I, I try not to cover uh, too much uh, ground that I, I did yesterday. Uh, and I, I wanted to be, perhaps go back to the very early days and, and, and really acknowledge uh, where it all began, in, at least in my mind, in neuroendocrine tumours, the, the seminal work done through the Sandoz Laboratories uh, in, in collaboration with the Erasmus Medical Centre and the, the fantastic work that John Cloyd Royby uh, did in uh, using immunohistochemistry to characterise the uh, tissue distribution uh, of the somatostatin receptor, which then became a target for uh, imaging uh, in the uh, late 80s and uh, for radionuclide therapy uh, shortly thereafter. These are the, the, the grand gentlemen of uh, neuroendocrine tumours, uh, Jean Cloyd and uh, Steve Lamberts, uh, Eric and Larry Qualls, uh, who I'm pleased to say are all good friends of mine now, um, who described uh, the uh, autoradiography um, using iodine-125 of the somatostatin receptor, and this is an insulinoma. They were perhaps somewhat lucky to, uh, to, to, uh, to see that because uh, in John Cloyd's own work, uh, only about 50% of benign insulinomas express that receptor. They started uh, quite logically uh, moving from iodine-125 to iodine-123 uh, uh, as an imaging agent uh, and fairly quickly moved on uh, to using indium. Uh, because they, they found, uh, I guess, a, a theme that will come out often in this meeting, it's not just the peptide that matters, that both the radionuclide and the collating agent or the me means of labelling the peptide have strike, can have striking differences on the biodistribution and handling of these peptides uh, by the body, and they found that iodine-123 uh, tyrosine octreotide was primarily excreted through the hepatobiliary system, which obviously for a, a gastrointestinal tumour is not the best uh, route of excretion, uh, whereas indium is obviously excreted through the kidneys, and that was really important seminal data. And, uh, over the last two decades, we've really seen a revolution, uh, not only an evolution in the, uh, the imaging of somatostatin receptors um, uh, in, in vivo uh, from the planar uh, indium-111 octreotide scans uh, through hybrid imaging and SPECT-CT and PET-CT to uh, PET-CT with gallium-based agents. And, and as Michael uh, pointed out so uh, eloquently, uh, that uh, progress is continuing to evolve and, and we're going to hear about some very exciting developments in, in, uh, in, in imaging. But that makes, has made a major difference. If you can see tiny lesions, you can better uh, select patients for treatment. When you know that they're there, you can follow them more accurately. And this tiny peritoneal uh, deposit, which comes and goes on the CT as the bowel fills and empties, um, uh, we know it's there and we don't worry about it being a new deposit because we, you know, we can see it and we can watch it. And uh, when we get a um, uh, look at the accuracy of this, it's extraordinarily high. Uh, these uh, curves of receiver operator characteristics, uh, the ideal place to live is in the top left-hand corner and uh, across a wide range of studies from a wide range of institutions, uh, it lives up in that uh, hallowed domain of 
excellent sensitivity and specificity. More importantly than that, if you can see the lesions, you can treat them more, more effectively and uh, that impacts management choices and across a whole range of uh, studies, uh, we've seen the high impact that this uh, uh, more sensitive uh, imaging test has had uh, on the management of patients with neuroendocrine tumours and as we learned yesterday from our uh, patient symposium, this has really impacted patients' lives profoundly. Uh, it's very exciting. Of course, we don't really know what we're missing. There's a, there's a famous study from, um, from France where they took patients who'd had MRI and uh, gallium imaging and uh, they cut out the liver or part of the liver uh, and they found that the sensitivity of both those tests, the best ones that we have for anatomical and functional imaging, were only about 50% sensitive we miss tiny lesions in, in the liver. That's of course because there is a finite resolution. and We're only as good as the best test we have. Uh, Galileo taught us that uh, a, a very long time ago when he got his telescope and looked at Jupiter and found that there were a whole lot of new stars, he thought, uh, uh, in the sky around Jupiter. But they moved and changed in, in, in position relative to Jupiter, so he worked out pretty quickly that they had to be moons. They'd always been there, but he saw them for the first time because he had a, a better instrument than, than his eye. And uh, if we look at... Uh, uh, the Hubble uh, telescope uh, went, went up there first time, it was slightly detuned and they've, they've retuned it. And uh, uh, for me, that's a bit like Specht and Pet. Uh, we're, we're not seeing new lesions and you have to be very aware of that when you're working clinically. If you have a, a patient had an indium scan and then they go and have a, a gallium a triotate scan, don't necessarily assume that they've progressed because you see a whole lot more disease and certainly don't rush into treatment uh, if they're otherwise well. Could we, could we see even more? And uh, you know, the, these uh, seminal works um, uh, from the, uh, the, the Basel group, Helmut Mackey and Jean-Claude Royby with Damien Wild, uh, working with colleagues in, in Freiburg and, and the, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, have done some really fascinating work uh, with uh, antagonists that, that bind to the somatostatin receptor in both its activated and deactivated stages, states. states. Uh, and they've shown uh, four to up, some, in some cases, up to 12-fold higher uptake in, uh, in tumours. And obviously, the more intense the uptake, the more sensitive the test is going to be. So we, we again, should be able to, to see more. I, I rail a bit and I get in trouble from my radiologists because uh, they think I'm being derogatory, uh, calling them lumpologists. Uh, but uh, in fact, we're, we're all guilty of that uh, in nuclear medicine as well as radiology. We, we count lumps, we measure them, we think uh, that we're doing well if those lumps are getting uh, smaller. Uh, but really, and we'll hear this from, from Ben uh, uh, later this morning, we're moving inexorably to needing an uh, an understanding of the biology of tumours and we're uniquely placed in nuclear medicine to understand the biology and uh, in this area the, the Copenhagen group have very nicely shown uh, that um, uh, as tumours become more aggressive they tend to lose the somatostatin receptor uh, and conversely uh, they, they tend to start uh, gaining more um, uh, uh, FDG avidity. Uh, and both of those findings have prognostic significance. Uh, uh, the well-differentiated tumours that have somatostatin receptors do better than the ones that don't. But conversely, the highly FDG avid tumours, uh, re representing a, a growing fraction of cells or a more aggressive component, have an adverse prognosis. And this is all critically relevant to selecting patients uh, for treatment uh, with peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. And uh, we live in very exciting times, I think, uh, where we have a wide range of peptides to, to our target of choice, the somat somatostatin subclass 2 receptor. Um, uh, large number of interesting agents are going to be presented here. A, a range of new collating agents. Uh, Michael mentioned sarcophagine for copper. 
uh, and a range of radionuclides, uh, alpha, uh, alpha emitters uh, recently entering into the field, uh, building on the work through OJ emitters and beta uh, particle emitters. And some agents like tubium that uh, uh, release both beta and OJ electrons and, and, and quite attractive. The work, I guess, uh, in many places in the world and, and, and historically, uh, we, we started with high administered activity, indium-111 uh, DTPA, um, but most of the world, I think, is, is now uh, pretty much uh, using uh, the lutetium-based agents. But I'm going to start with um, uh, Octrea scan, but also mention uh, some work, um, uh, and the, the seminal work from the, uh, the Basel group with uh, uh, yttrium um, octreotate, uh, or triothur. As I said, Marion de Jong is in the audience and uh, she's, she's done a, a fabulous job preclinically uh, in particular uh, over the years in uh, giving us great understanding of the biology and, and uh, mechanisms of, of radionuclide therapy and, and the protection of normal tissues uh, uh, with uh, amino acids. And this is one of the earliest experiments where uh, cells were uh, injected into the portal system and uh, metastasized to the liver and when the, uh, the, the animals were treated with uh, indium-111 as an OJ emitter, the uh, development of metastases was markedly attenuated. And this was data that I saw in the uh, early 90s and, and really inspired me to get involved in uh, doing uh, treatment uh, of uh, neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumours. And particularly, this first case um, uh, was a, uh, a case of glucagonoma, a rare neuroendocrine tumour, uh, where um, uh, there was a, uh, a marked reduction in uh, the hormone secretion. Uh, the, the, this disease, while rather indolent in many patients, is terribly symptomatic. Uh, patients become, uh, have very brittle diabetes, they get terrible rashes on their, their skin and uh, they treated this patient with uh, great um, uh, clinical response. And it so happened that my cardiac stress nurse uh, in, in my department had a glucagonoma and I wrote to uh, Eric and he very kindly provided both his protocol and peptide, uh, which was the beginning of our program and he's been a great supporter of, uh, of my program for the last 20 years and given me great advice. And, and also uh, Dick Quekerboom uh, as his other clinical partner in this and uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Dick uh, is uh, very sick at the moment and we, we send our, our very best wishes to him. Uh, they uh, subsequently published a, a larger series where they, they showed excellent uh, disease control uh, with this uh, in terms of stabilisation of previously progressive disease and some minor tumour shrinkage. Very few patients had what we'd consider a resist response, but they did show marked clinical improvement uh, in their, um, uh, their outcomes. Part of the reason I think that they didn't get as good results uh, perhaps as we'd hope with something that's getting right into the cell and, and delivering its radiation is we didn't have the, the benefit of crossfire uh, and that if all the cells didn't have the same level of somatostatin receptor expression, uh, some of those cells got little or no radiation at all. And the real uh, big advance was to start to use the crossfire effect of um, beta emitting particles. And the first of those was yttrium with a, uh, a one centimetre roughly uh, maximum path length. Uh, that's great for irradiating big tumours. Unfortunately, there's a lot of collateral damage around uh, uh, the tissues that don't necessarily have that receptor but are within the path length of the beta particles. And, uh, early studies showed significant renal toxicity, uh, although that was ameliorated uh, by amino acid infusion uh, and not insubstantial bone marrow toxicity. And the, really the game changer uh, for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy was lutetium, uh, which uh, still a beta emitter but had a very short path length and, and gave uh, very dense uh, radiation to tumours. Again, the Erasmus group uh, described excellent uh, response uh, in a, uh, quite a sizable subgroup, which they'd subsequently follow up with a, a massive group of, of 500 uh, patients. They looked at the uh, toxicity and found really very minor toxicity, as you'd expect from the short path length and very specific targeting. 
they did again describe some cases of myelodysplastic syndrome, but re really rather few. Uh, and the efficacy was, was excellent uh, with uh, partial responses and, and complete responses in 30% and minimal responses in another 15 or so percent, uh, with a median progression free survival uh, uh, measured in uh, out to around four years. And, this really, uh, in my mind, uh, started the theranostic revolution uh, in um, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Some people put a, a G in there. Uh, I'm not sure what's correct uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, linguistic term, but uh, I, I sort of think of agnostics as people who don't quite believe in something. Uh, I, I think we're all believers here, aren't we? I can say that in this audience. This, this idea of imaging and then uh, marrying molecular imaging with targeted therapeutics to give the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. And although we're believers, I have to inform you that most of the rest of the world aren't. Uh, th th there are many disbelievers. And this, this is an, an article just published online in the last week or two from Marion Pavel, who's one of the leading opinion uh, makers in the uh, European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, looking at the history of effective therapies in neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see, where does PRRT come in? Not in 1992, uh, with the uh, advent of indium-111 octreotide, uh, not in 2005 with the publication of, uh, of uh, lutetium uh, so, um, octreotate therapy, but only in 2015 uh, with the randomised control trial of Jonathan Strasberg, which, as Michael mentioned, is going to be presented here at this meeting. And the data are impressive. These are the preliminary data, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing them updated, but impressive progression-free survival difference. Uh, I sometimes joke uh, that um, if you look at some of the approved drugs, that if you've got a bit of a tremor on your laser pointer, you can't get the laser pointer between the curves. And yet they're statistically significant because they've got so many patients in the trial that a small difference is, is given statistical significance. This is clinically uh, a significant difference in progression-free survival. And uh, again, this is going to be updated, but uh, already on interim analysis, the curves for overall survival, this is an endpoint that is unimpeachable. People being alive or dead is uh, a very important uh, endpoint and not one you can really um, uh, play around with too much. But we've always been accused, and the reason that it hasn't got onto Marion's chart is because we haven't reached the pinnacle of those uh, hierarchies of evidence, levels of evidence, the, the pyramid. Uh, but is it fair? Uh, that a lack of randomised controlled trial data uh, is uh, seen as a lack of evidence. I think we have abundant evidence. Uh, we'd all like to build the pyramid, you know, something that's enduring and is going to stay there forever. But there's another kind of pyramid called the Az Aztec pyramid, uh, which doesn't have a top on it. And, and you know what happened on the top of those Aztec pyramids? They sacrificed uh, uh, young women and, and men, usually very attractive ones. Uh, to, the, to the gods, uh, and I, I wonder how many patients around the world are still being sacrificed because we don't have that cap uh, firmly in place on our pyramid. We've known since the earliest publication of, of uh, Dick Weckerboom and, and the Erasmus team that this is a highly effective therapy. If we compare it to other uh, approved and routinely used therapies, the uh, uh, PR-CR response rate is at least as good as any of those treatments. The uh, progression-free survival is substantially longer. The overall survival, again, the unimpeachable endpoint, again, at least as good as any of the previous trials and often significantly better. And that's not just the experience of Erasmus. This, this has been emulated in a huge number of uh, uh, trials now, increasing number. And I've, uh, to summarise some of them there, looking at overall survival. And you can see that the overall survival in these series is measured in years, not in months. 
one of the arguments that people have made when we've presented our data, you've taken the best players because you've selected them on the basis of a differentiation marker, the presence of the somatostatin receptor, which, as, as the uh, Copenhagen group showed you, is associated with a good prognosis. So we decided to look at the group of patients who have the poor prognosis, that have high FDG avidity. They're, they're a bad group. And our overall survival uh, in this series uh, was 55 months uh, and progression-free survival four years. Uh, so really excellent results. But how, how does that compare uh, to patients who don't have um, uh, uh, PRRT? Well, we don't have a control group because we don't think we can ethically, uh, on the basis of our experience and the other data, uh, not treat patients uh, if they're suitable. Uh, this is a group of patients from France where they didn't have access to PRRT, where they looked at a subgroup of patients who were both positive on somatostatin receptor imaging and on FDG, and you can see that the median overall survival in that group was only 19 months, so uh, roughly a third of the overall survival in our group. Progression-free survival, uh, which also has uh, significant implications in terms of the symptoms that people live with for a long time with this disease, uh, is also very different. Uh, if we look at uh, approved drugs like Everolimus and Sunitinib, uh, their median progression-free survival is 11 months, but these are now routinely approved in most of the developed world because of randomised controlled trial data showing that improvement in progression-free survival compared to a placebo. Uh, Sunitinib, if anyone's ever used it, is a horrible drug. Uh, there's a quote from um, uh, John and Carson that said, uh, most married men live longer but are more willing to die. Uh, I, I think that's true of Sunitinib, uh, that uh, most patients uh, on Sunitinib might live a little longer but they become much more willing to die uh, because of the side effects. It's sort of God's chaperone, uh, easing you into, you know, I'm ready to die, thank you very much, take me off Sunitinib. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we see, and, and Michael's uh, spoken about this and is going to be presented again, the improvement in quality of life that we see with, uh, with lutetium, uh, octreotate and PRRT uh, is substantial. Our data, of course, is retrospective, but so too is um, uh, one of the most widely adopted regimens in medical oncology these days, uh, the CAPTEM chemotherapy combo, again on the basis of work that uh, Jonathan Stras Strasberg did at the Moffat Cancer Centre, but this was only 30 patients, a retrospective study, and yet the oncologists had embraced it on, in the absence of a randomised control trial. There's other data as well supporting it as a, as a regimen, but nevertheless the progression-free survival of that's only 18 months. One of the things that I hope we, we get to talk about a little bit in this meeting is, is uh, how we deliver PRRT. And uh, regulatory authorities love us to be standardised, to do everything by uh, protocol, give everyone the same protocol, do it all at the same time, let's harmonise what we do. And, and a lot of guidelines are about harmonisation these days. But is that the right thing to do with this therapy? We, we know that there can be vastly different doses to the kidneys and bone marrow depending on the burden of disease because of the sink effect and uh, also where there's low avidity versus high avidity, the radiation dose to tumour varies very considerably. And so uh, you know, we really need to think about optimising the administered activity because administered activity doesn't equal dose doses what the tumour sees in terms of radiation. Should we be basing our selection of patients only on tumour grade when biopsy can be completely random and miss the uh, important elements of disease? Um, should we not be treating FDG avid disease because they have adverse prognoses? Uh, uh, these are all important questions. And should we be changing the isotope that we use uh, based on the size of the lesions that we see? We've uh, developed an algorithm uh, w which is based on uh, a probabilistic uh, but actually an imaged uh, uh, appearance of these tumours that as the grade of tumours uh, increases, the likelihood of somatostatin receptor 
uh, re receptor expression decreases, but it doesn't disappear, even in some high-grade tumours like small cell lung cancer, whereas uh, the likelihood of FDG avidity increases, but they overlap. Uh, again, uh, the Binder Up paper showed very nicely that even low-grade tumours can have both somatostatin receptor and glucose use. Most people are focusing on the green there to treat patients that they have somatostatin receptors, and most of us realise that you can't treat a, a tumour that lacks the somatostatin receptor. That's the target. That's, that's a no-go zone. We actually believe that the patients who most benefit and are most likely to respond uh, because they have actively growing cells, are the group that sit in the middle. Uh, we think this is a sweet spot for PRRT. And so like the traffic lights, red means stop, green means go, uh, and orange means proceed with caution, but feel very good if you get through uh, without hitting a red light. Which comes to, uh, I guess, one of the, the, the questions I get, often get asked, we can't have access to FTG and it's very expensive. You know, is it really worth doing it? You know, the, the patient here has got a beautiful gallium scan, lots and lots of disease. Surely we could treat this patient. Oh yeah, the FDG's avid as well, but let's perhaps look at it more carefully. And this is elegant uh, graphics Michael Hoffman did. He's a bit of a, a computer nerd. He's very good at doing this stuff. Uh, and you can see that the FDG and the GATATE uh, isn't quite concordant, uh, that there are areas that are concordant, which are in green, and there's a few that are uh, getting into the orange and red that are discordant. And obviously we can't target the discordant disease. And although it's a small proportion of this patient's disease, uh, it's an important proportion because it's not going to see radiation. We treated this patient nevertheless because they had severe hormone-related symptoms and the majority of the disease was well differentiated. And as you'd expect, the stuff that had the target shrank. That's what you'd expect it to do. The stuff that didn't have the target stayed there. And as you can see, uh, the, the uh, GATATE scans showing a significant improvement over time. FDG also improved in, in part, uh, but the areas that were red uh, were still there and, and discordant and growing uh, despite the therapy. So we can see the future, we can predict the future uh, by the imaging phenotype. Many people have said, don't treat G3 disease. It, it, it's not suitable for PRRT. But these are very actively growing cells and they're patients who need treatment. This is a patient with a, a G3 neuroendocrine carcinoma, intense gatate avidity, fabulous response. It's hard to argue uh, that this patient did not benefit from, from PRRT, particularly when we know that the patient had already failed aggressive chemotherapy, which is supposed to be the treatment of choice uh, for these diseases. And following PRT, that adverse signal went away completely. So we've started using it up front in poor prognosis patients. This is a, a GP with extensive infiltration of the portal venous system, high-grade tumour. After three cycles of treatment, melted away. She went holidaying in France. Um, uh, wouldn't take me with her, unfortunately, uh, but uh, uh, she had a good time, I, I gather. Can we give it again? And you know, people think you know, four cycles is, is, is all we do because that's what the protocol said, four cycles, or 23 gray to the kidneys, as if that was ever a, a real number. We've given uh, up to 15 uh, cycles in, 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 in a large number of cases, guided by the phenotype and the progression of the patient. This is a patient uh, treated over a long period of time with uh, um, additional cycles of treatment when the disease <laughs> recruits symptomatically uh, after a, a very excellent response. We have to also think that we can use this in combination with other therapies, with chemotherapy, if we have different imaging phenotypes. This is a patient with some disease that's FDG avid, exclusively some that's uh, somatostatin receptor, giving the patient chemotherapy up front, dealt with the FDG uh, activity, the red stuff disappeared, the green stuff was left and we then treated the patient with PRRT. 
What about bigger, bulky deposits? We found that they don't respond so well to lutetium. We've just recently published uh, some work with yttrium, cycling it with PRRT, with lutetium PRRT, showing an an excellent overall survival and progression-free survival in this really adverse group of patients, high morphologic response rate and a high functional imaging response rate. And this is an example of, of uh, dosimetry with uh, uterine PET showing uh, delivering close to six, 70 gray of radiation from, from, from the uterium and over the course of the cycle over uh, 200 grey and of course when you deliver 200 grey to a tumour it turns up its heels and you get an excellent morphologic and imaging response. Of course all of that is retrospective dosimetry. We're looking at what we've given and you can't take it back or you can't give any more. So ideally uh, we'd like to, uh, although this is very important for uh, optimising our therapy, being able to do dose verification uh, in the future, what we really want to have is a half-life tracer long enough that gives us prospective dosimetry, and copper is one area. Unfortunately, <laughs> copper tends to fall off uh, dota um, as a collating agent, and Michael shown some work that we did with the Bio21 group uh, here in, in Melbourne and, and Clarity Pharmaceuticals um, to look at a copper sarcophagene, which shows very high uh, uptake and retention and also opens up the possibility of using copper 67 as a therapeutic radionuclide. And the very high uh, uh, tumour to background you get at late time points is very encouraging for that. We can also look at the possibility of using antagonists uh, therapeutically, and again, uh, excellent work by Helmut Mackey and, and John Cloyd Groyby and Damien Wilde, uh, doing the initial uh, trials of antagonists. Uh, so in conclusion, I think we've come uh, a long way, uh, but there's still far to go, and I'm really excited about this meeting, uh, that we're uh, going to hear some great advances in this field. There's options for new radionuclides and peptides, uh, new combination therapies are needed and I, I think uh, we should all think of in, engaging with our medical oncology um, our colleagues to use this in combination with radiosensitising agents and potentially with immunotherapy and that uh, optimisation of administered activity through routine radiation dosimetry challenges the convenience of a one-size-fits-all uh, protocol that I think is going to be really vital to the advancement of our uh, science and with that I thank you for your attention.